Thank you for tuning in to Tag Church here in Little Rock, Arkansas. We pray that this message will truly be a blessing to you today. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so by going to tagchurch.net. Also, if you have any prayer requests, don't hesitate to send them to the email on your screen. We would love to partner with you in prayer. Now, I hope you're ready for a word from the Lord today. Let's get right into it, and God bless you. It truly is an honor to be here in Little Rock. All I can think of is the Colin Ray song when I come to Little Rock. Anybody know that song? Well, it's a really great song. You should know it. Anyway. We are living in a really strange time, and I'm going to try to speak to you about that, and I'm going to um, speak to you not as a guest speaker. I'm not going to speak to you as a pastor. I'm going to speak to you as one who's seen revival, is anticipating a revival to come, want to see the outpouring of God on a level yet unexperienced, but one of the things that Brownsville taught me was preparing the ground. And I understand that this crowd here loves revival. And um, I think there are some steps to moving in power. A lot of people preach a lot of sermons about the power of God. They preach about signs, wonders, and miracles. They preach about the outpouring of power, raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons. And those are wonderful sermons and true, and it does happen. My mother raised people, two people from the dead in her ministry. Uh, I've seen it happen. My mother was raised up from cancer diagnosis to die twice. My uncle, uh, Mose, uh, miraculously healed after being wounded in Vietnam, and God has raised him up a couple of times. We're like the Ever Ready Bunny, you can't kill us. You just can't kill us. And for those of you who don't know, I uh, suffered an aortic dissection, not a heart attack, so just get that out of your head. I did not have a heart attack. Uh, it would have been better had I had a heart attack, actually, but my heart's in great shape, but I had what's called an aortic dissection, which basically means the major artery that goes from your heart up and from your heart down the biggest artery in your bo body comes apart. It starts delaminating, and you bleed out internally. And uh, most people die before they ever get to the hospital. Uh, it's quick. It's unexpected. There was no warnings. Uh, happened on a Saturday night. I was a uh, Saturday morning, rather. It's Friday night. I was on the phone with my board. I was washing my wife's truck. If you saw her truck, you'd know what a job that is. My wife, I wish she drove some little mousy girl truck, but she drives a Ram 3500 dually with a flatbed. <laughs> That's what she drives. And I was washing that, and I was washing my truck, and feeling fine, took my family out to dinner that Saturday night, and then uh, got up on Saturday morning and uh, didn't feel exactly right. And from the time I got up, I asked, I remember asking for water. My wife got me a glass of water, and I don't remember anything beyond that. Apparently, I went into a full attack of some sort and uh, passed out. My boy, my son, my youngest son is not here. Matter of fact, that red-haired boy there in the second row reminds me of my son. He's red-headed <laughs> like that. And, uh, and um, he held me up until the paramedics got there. Uh, they took me to one hospital. They couldn't help me there because it was an aortic dissection. They took me to Vanderbilt University Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I don't remember anything from Saturday morning until Tuesday night when I woke up in um, intensive care. And uh, I did have no idea what an aortic dissection was. I had all these tubes in me and all this sort of thing. And I thought I had, a, I thought I had wrecked my truck or something. I, I didn't know what had happened. And they began to tell me what happened. And um, on Sunday, they had to open me up again after doing major. They have to open your heart and cut your 
It's kind of gross. You're stirring them in two and move all that and take your heart and move it and all. It was crazy. It was very serious. And they have to put that. I'm now a cowboy because I have a cow valve. All the, I have a, a cow uh, uh, a, uh, aorta now with a cow valve. So if I moo every once in a while, you'll understand. <laughs> So, uh, and this is from the guy who maybe had a little too much weight, but I never have had high blood pressure, high blood sugar, none of that. I have none of that. I don't drink, smoke, or chew. I go with girls that do. <laughs> and uh, none of that stuff. And never had high blood pressure, any of that. So this was totally shocking, totally unexpected. Second day, I started internal bleeding and bleeding on my brain, and they opened me up again and had to clear all that out and gave me 48 hours to live or die. And after 48 hours, I woke up on Tuesday night and uh, was very much alive. And I remember having a breathing tube down my throat when I woke up, and I couldn't breathe. Could talk about stupid. That's why it's there. But it just feels, have you ever had a breathing tube? I mean, the big daddy one, not the little girly one. <laughs> the big daddy one. And I woke up, and it was in there, and I was choking, and I thought, I can't breathe. And I said to whoever was by me, I said, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. The second time I said that, the Holy Spirit in my right ear said, calm down and endure this. You're going to survive. And I just calmed down and convinced them to take the tube out by the next morning. And uh, off to the races and uh, doing well. And then about uh, six months later, got to where I couldn't breathe again. And now they told me I had a mitral valve prolapse. So I got to have open heart surgery again in six months right here. So now I'm cut here. I look like I've been in a bar fight <laughs> or a church board meeting, one or the other. <laughs> Kind of the same thing. Um, and like from here to here and then over here. And then about, uh, see, March, April, May, June, July, five months later, I had two more surgeries. So I had about five surgeries in about a year. <laughs> Tell me how you feel. So I'm thankful to be singing and dancing and worshiping Jesus. Yeah. And, uh, I am absolutely a miracle. Um, you, you have a 30% chance of survival if they get you on the operating table within an hour. They didn't put me on the operating table for six hours. And my chances of survival went down to between 10 and 15%. And God said no. So how many prayed for me? How many prayed for me? Okay, it's your fault. I was trying to get to heaven. What'd you do that for? I've been trying to die ever since I got saved. And here I am. So, perilous times we're living in, but also exciting times. This is not, this is a heavy message, but not a down message. It's a message straight from God to, to you through me. Something the Lord spoke to me a while back. I began to see changes going on. About three years ago, I had a vision. And in the vision, there was a big book about the size of this whole top of this podium. And it was open. And I saw a forearm. And I saw a right hand. And I saw a page lifted up like you're turning it. And it was just at 10 o'clock right there. And I knew I had to ask what was going on because it was such an open vision. It was so clear. I said, God, what is that? He said, I'm turning the page. And I said, okay. So before you turn it, what's on the page you're covering up over here? He said, it's the names of my men and women that I am not going to be able to use because I've been calling them for years to holiness, to fasting and to prayer, and they will not let go of their vices. 
I love them, I have used them, and they are household names. But in the next few years, you'll see them disappear. And I went, okay, so Lord, what's on this page? He goes, these are unknowns. These are the ones that have been on the backside of their father's farm, taking care of my sheep. These are the ones I'm about to move on mightily. It's a whole nother generation. And I, I, you know, the Lord was not gleeful about the ones he was not going to use anymore. He was sad. See, I want to tell you something about sin in the ministry. Sin in the ministry doesn't happen quick. Sin doesn't happen quick. A little fantasy, a little thing here, a little thing there. And you gradually, for men in particular, a fantasy that comes by way of dreams at night when you're resting. And you love it when you wake up and realize you weren't really doing that. But then later on you think, man, that was really good. I wish I could visit again now that I know it's safe. That's where you create a vain imagination. And when you get a vain imagination, you have the, you have the breeding ground of fantasy. That thought was not put there by the Holy Spirit. It was put there by a demon spirit. You see? And what you're doing by going to visit it in your safe place, you're going to visit something that is eventually going to trip you up because the devil has now put his finger on a place of weakness. He goes, ah, that's something they want. Now, this cannot just be sexual. It can be anything. That's something they want. So what he'll start doing very slowly is preparing the right person for the right time to interact with you at just the right time when your marriage is at a low place or your heart is at a low place or you're walking through a dry place and all of a sudden your fantasy will appear and she or he will look like just the perfect thing, the door will open and because you've now treaded over the path of your conscience so many times and visited it in a secret place, what you've really been doing is knocking your hedge down and walking on the hedge that was supposed to protect you because you thought you did it in a secret place, but it wasn't a secret at all because all the heart of men will be laid open, the Bible says, and every hidden thing will be declared from the rooftop. Nobody preaches like that anymore, but there it is. So I, I, several years I, I watched the fall of a prominent minister, and it was very visible, very disappointing. And one of the count, uh, confusing issues was the fact that while he was in sin, he was hiding it from everyone, and he was still having miracles in his ministry. How can you have miracles in your ministry and people blind eyes open and healed? How does that happen? I don't know. Ask Saul how he prophesied when God had not chosen him any longer and had moved on. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You can still do what you're called to do, whether it's holy or unholy or a mixture. I'm talking to somebody here tonight. Yeah, Brother Gentle. Don't you love it when the pastor has gentle Brother Lindell, the little feeble heart patient that was about dead? Don't you wish I was dead right now? It confused everyone. And when he fell, many people were discouraged and they turned away from the church. I remember reading the comments when it came public and I, my heart broke for this young man who wrote this article, this uh, comment. He said, I was saved in his ministry and I'm a brand new Christian. And he said, if a man of his stature can't live it, what hope is there is for me? And my heart broke. See, I want to tell you something. I don't know why I'm doing this. Pastor, I don't ever do this as a visitor. <laughs> but there's some people in this room tonight that are hiding sin. 
And you think it's never going to come out on you. But let me tell you, the love of Jesus will bring it out on you. The love of the Holy Ghost will expose it, not because he's mad, but because he loves you so much. And he wants you to repent of it and move on. And get past it. There's power to get past it. It does not have to take you over. But you got to quit hiding it. When you sin, it affects the whole church. Because we are fitly joined together. When this happened, I went to my time with the Lord and I said, God, give me a word from you. And he did. And I saw things fall together in the Bible. I want to share them with you. And I think they're going to help you. I think they're going to encourage you. I know that was a heavy intro. But I think they're going to encourage you. I think they're going to bless you. I think they're going to give you fuel of how to fight the enemy. You can overcome. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, you can overcome. There is nothing you can't overcome. There is no temptation except what is common to man. But in every situation, temptation, God makes a way of escape. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. So you don't have to stay in it anymore. You can be free of it. So I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, um, Talk to me about what the progression is that we need to walk in power. Because I'm tired of men and women who walk in power falling into sin. Lord, please help me understand, is there something we're missing? And this is what the Lord showed me. We must understand that God right now in 2024 in this crazy year about what's to, well, of, of what's about to break out spiritually in the in in the in the church and spiritually in the nation what's about to break out is going to look very confusing and very troublesome for a lot of people but i want you to understand that God has his church right now on track to step into these times With authority and power. That's what he's up to. The first step that we all take is what I will call, number one, grace. I grew up Pentecostal. We didn't understand grace very well. We got saved every Sunday night. Right? Every Sunday night we had a move of God and repented. Over and over and over again. Right? We did not understand how to approach grace and how to embrace grace. I think think right now in the church I praise God for the fact that we do have a real good understanding of grace right now in the kingdom of heaven. We are understanding it like never before. I wrote down a few a few verses. Proverbs 3.34, he scoffs at the scoffers, but he gives grace to the afflicted. Romans 6.15, what then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under law, but under grace. May it never be. 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. Now, I want you to read that. Look at that with me. 1 Corinthians 3.10. According to what? Work with me. We'll be here all night. According to what? Grace. Grace gave me. I was given grace. I didn't earn grace. I got it for free. Because it was given to me, I, like a wise master builder, laid a foundation. In other words, grace is foundational. If you don't stand on, I'm saved by grace through faith. If you don't understand it's not of works lest any man should boast, then you are never going to walk in authority with the Lord because you're always going to doubt whether you're saved or not. My salvation does not hinge on 
whether I think of God every minute, every day. It doesn't matter about a lot of things in my life. The fact of the matter is my desire is to follow Jesus, and I have built on the foundation of grace. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain, but I labored more than all of them. Wait, oh, wait, so, stop, stop. Whoa, 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 what? You mean you got free grace and then you kept working? Linda, I thought you said it wasn't words. <laughs> Let me explain something to you, theologically. I don't know why we can't get this, but we can't. It's like my choir. They turn into mealy mouth singers every Sunday morning until I get up in front of them and go, okay, sing! <laughs> oh, okay. I have to say it over and over and over. Say this with me. I am saved. I am saved. Now let me ask you this. What are you saved from? What are you saved from? You're scared to say it now, aren't you? You're scared to death. I'm not saved from hell. I'm not saved from sin. I'm saved from the wrath of God. Right? You mean God's got wrath? Mm -hmm, yeah, he does. Hang out a minute, you'll see it. Right? I am not saved by works. The salvation that came to me by the blood of Jesus came free. I'm saved because I confessed my sins and the Holy Spirit did an inner work and transformed me into a new creature. And I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Therefore, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I am saved, not because of anything I did. But after I'm saved, I work. As a matter of fact, my works will be judged after I'm saved. I'm not going to be at the white throne judgment in Revelation because everybody there goes to hell. Their names are not found and he's going to say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. Every person, small and great, the Bible says, will stand before him and all of them go to hell. But there is a thing called the Bema Seat. After the rapture, somewhere in between the rapture and the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, somewhere in there where you and I are going to receive a crown and rewards for our work. And you're going, well, I just thought I got in and that's all I need to do. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. That's all I need. Jesus, just give me more Jesus. But you don't help your neighbor. You don't volunteer at church. You don't feed the poor. You don't do nothing. You a big old useless saved pile of nothing. And when you get to heaven, one of the songs my mama used to sing to me, by Mahalia Jackson, a skinny white robe, a tiny little crown, a second-hand robe full of patches, a skinny white robe, a tiny little crown, a robe so woolly that it scratches. <laughs> oh, God's, God, God's woke, did you not know? He treats everybody the same. Everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> Not in this kingdom. Not in this kingdom. Steve Hill, one of the last meetings I had with him before he died, Steve Hill was the evangelist who preached five years to Brownsville Revival. He had moved to Dallas and 
he was ailing in health, and I wanted to meet with him again. And I drove all the way out there, and I sat in the middle of his office with him. And his office was lined by all these old books, just old books. He and I both love old books. We read mostly dead people <laughs> because we know they made it to heaven on that theology. You know what I'm saying? The new guys, I'm not so sure. We'll see. <laughs> You know, we know Bill Graham made it in, but William Branham, we're not sure about that. So I don't know where that went off the rails, but somewhere it did. So I don't want to jump on that, that wagon until I know, right? So I'm sitting there with John, I'm sitting there with Steve Hill, and we're looking at a little table in the middle of his office, all these old books, and he says, I have to show you something, Lyndall, that came to me today. And I said, okay. So out of an envelope, he pulls this picture. The picture is of a young man being baptized in the Middle East somewhere and he has no arms. And he's being baptized in it, How many were at Brown's Revival? Steve had these crystal blue eyes that were frightening to look at. Tears start running down his face and he said, you, you know what that is, Lyndall? I said, what? He said, that's a young man who gave his heart to Jesus. And because he was Muslim, his family cut his arms off. <laughs> he said, I got a question. I said, yeah? He goes, if he sits across the table from you at the marriage supper and he looks at you and says, tell your story, what you gonna tell him? And he looked with tears and he said, we better have a story. <laughs> we better have a story. So you better have works. If you, ain't in, if you ain't involved in your local church, get involved. My son right now, Samuel, I just let him go. This man is, a worship supreme kind of dude and God has transformed his life and he is all into street evangelism he's starting to bother me because I take him on trips and I never know when he's coming out of the store because he'll corner people <laughs> if your faith is something you can contain it ain't much no wonder nobody wants it Because of the grace, I made sure, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that it did not prove vain. God did not waste his time giving me grace, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace within me. So everybody say, grace is the door. I'm not going to preach it long, but I could preach all night. Y'all are awesome. So everybody comes into the door of the kingdom of heaven by grace. Right? We Pentecostals didn't quite get that. I think it's because we had a lot of mean preachers who had ugly wives. <laughs> How many know what Pente old Pentecost was? Roll Okay, for all you newbies, let me clarify that statement. When I grew up, the women couldn't wear makeup, couldn't cut their hair, couldn't put on jewelry, and if you weren't naturally beauty, you were beautiful, you were in trouble. <laughs> but to men, we kept a nice haircut, and we looked great. But if our wives were not just beauty queens by birth, there wasn't a thing they could do to help it. And I think that made those preachers meaner. <laughs> Don't you, Thomas? We were going to hell all the time. <laughs> I don't know. You be careful. Your life will fall out. You never know if you're saved or not. I mean, there was this, this over a book, Armenianism out the wazoo. Like, we're just going to fall away any minute. And then our eternal security people over here were telling us it doesn't matter. You're always saved. You got it once. You're good. Took me all my life to figure out in the middle is the truth. <laughs> and that it really is hard to fall away from God. It is not easy. You can't do it overnight. It's slowly, but you can do it. But it ain't going to happen just because you got out of the altar crying and speaking in tongues and all. tomorrow you're unsaved. I don't believe that. Grace. 
Oh, thank you for grace. Grace is connected to another theological term called propitiation, which doesn't get preached on either. How many don't know what propitiation means? Hold your hand up high. Hold it high. Let me tell you what it means. Propitiation means that all of the wrath of God against sin that should have been put on me was put on Jesus. Jesus hung on the cross and said, Father, you're a holy God and you desire a holy people, but they're not. They've sinned against you, and Lord, they deserve death. But Lord, let Father put all their sin on me, and I'll carry it for them. Do you feel that? I just felt the Holy Ghost move in here. That's grace. Jesus took your place. Hallelujah. Let me move on. So now that we have got grace, what's the next step? Now we're going to go raise the dead and cast out demons? Not yet. The Lord told me the next step that saints of God should go through is this one right here. Disciple. Disciple means to intransitively become a pupil. A disciple, a scholar. A disciple to be instructed, to be taught. Matthew 10, 4, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. See, this, this breaks the confusion of am I a son or a slave? Am I a servant of God or am I an ambassador of God? You're all of them. By his grace, you have been adopted and you are a king and a priest before your God. But by choice, you're a disciple who sits and listens to everything he says. And you say, I'll serve you, Lord. What do you want? You're both. It's not either or. You're both. Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, his mother. Oh, this is the words of Jesus. That precious, lovely Jesus who would just never hurt anybody. <laughs> just never a never strong word. Wash the prostitute's feet. Do you hear it all the time on the streets? Don't judge me. Jesus is going to judge me. Oh, you really don't want that. <laughs> You'd rather I judge you, I promise you. Because there's that little passage in Revelation where it says the lamb. Who's the lamb? Say his name. Who? Jesus. The Bible says, the Bible says, New Testament for all you Camelites. <laughs> if you know what it is, you laughed. If you don't, you laughed out of courtesy. <laughs> Watch this. The lamb. The Bible says the wicked and the ungodly will be cast into eternal fire in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. Same Jesus. Same Jesus. We're just not to that chapter yet. Right now he's the pleading Savior. But he's about to be the severe judge. And when he does, that one, when we're singing eyes of fire, that's not the pleading Savior sword going out of his mouth. That's not the pleading. That is an avenging God who's coming back to take out vengeance on everyone who has rejected him. Don't yeah. you glad you got a manly God? Yeah. Instead of this God, oh, it's just so Jesus wouldn't just touch it. Glad we got a Jesus that's a mighty warrior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this will never be aired, and I'll get hate mail. Who cares? Don't hate me because you ain't me. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers or sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What, wait, wait a minute, what are you saying, Jesus? I'm supposed to hate everybody? No, it's real simple. Jesus is saying 
that if your love for your mother, father, sister, wife, brothers, and your own life doesn't look like hate when you compare it to the love you have for me, you're not worthy of it. In other words, Jesus must be supreme above yourself. Okay, so you got to love him that much. Instead of judgment, grace becomes a vehicle to transport us to mercy. Without grace, we have no hope. Let's look at one more disciple verse, a couple more. Matthew 10, 25. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me, I already did that one. Um, Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We have to be disciple to follow after God. And a disciple is the one thing that brings us to real knowledge of the Savior. Here's the problem, saints. We have never been more biblically illiterate than we are right now. We are so biblically illiterate, we don't read the Bible. If I ask God how many of you, I'm in a series on Revelation at my church right now. When I asked my church how many had not read Revelation, it was almost 100%. Why? Why? Why are you not reading the Bible? Just because it, oh, it's so hard to understand. And y'all figured out, remember that Pokemon game a few years ago where you'd run all over town and y'all figured that out. Right? You figure out what you want to. But without the knowledge of the word, you're open for deception. When a preacher preaches, there should be a computer going in your head judging everything he says against the word. Everything. Don't you ever believe a preacher above the word? And don't you believe a preacher who, de- who just says the word is not the supreme being? Oh, it's just, I- I've heard preachers, well, you know, it's got some fallacies in it. Leave that church right now. If the word is not supreme. Well, it's an old book. Well, leave him right now. One guy was saying, you know, there are 948 uh, contradictions in the Bible. And he's talking about a particular translation of the Bible in its first draft where the man who translated it by hand, thank you very much, realized that he had made 948 mistakes, which he went back and corrected. Notice how the enemy wants to cherry pick. You can't trust the word. Well, if you can't trust the word, you can't trust anything. Why do you believe an ancient book? Why don't you? I don't understand. Okay? Jesus is the most historically provable figure in the world. Is this all right? I don't know what you call this. It sure ain't, I don't know if it's a revival preaching or prep for revival, but I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up here. A disciple wants to be like his master. A disciple wants to know what his master thinks. Somebody says, I don't read the Old Testament because it's not applicable to me. There's a movement currently to just read the words of Jesus only. Isn't that right, Sam? Just the words of Jesus, okay? So I have to throw the epistles out. But the truth of the matter is if you want to know what God thinks, how, what he likes, and how he feels, read the Old Testament. It'll tell you everything about him that you'll never learn any other, any other way. Even Paul said the Old Testament, the law, is a good schoolmaster. All right? So, discipleship. Be discipled. Humble yourself under the teacher. Find yourself a spiritual leader. Find a pastor. You need a pastor. You need a pastor. You really do. I think I need to just stay here just a moment. You need a pastor. I know you're spiritual and all, and I know you can hear from the Lord in your own prayer closet, but you need a pastor to slap you upside the head sometimes. And if you're in one of those churches where that pastor don't step on your toes occasionally, don't pay your tithes. Leave. You need to go find one. Yeah, you need to find you one. When John Kilpatrick preaches to this day, I feel like he's been reading my thoughts all week long. 
And it's like he walks across my spirit and starts pulling stuff out. And it's not even what he says, it's what he says in between what he doesn't say. And he'll make a phrase and the Holy Ghost will say something else and I'll go, oh God, yes. It happens under the ministry of the anointing of my pastor like nowhere else in the world. You would not have known about my aortic dissection if my pastor hadn't put it on the internet and let you know to pray for me. I would probably be dead if it weren't for John Kilpatrick making sure everybody knew to pray for me. The saints of God all over the world prayed for me. You need a pastor. And they're probably not going to be perfect, but get under something, my Lord. Should I do it? Yeah, I'm going to. I met some people years ago, probably after I just started Grace Church, and uh, they'd been a part of a great church that I'd known years ago. I met them in a parking lot at a restaurant. I hadn't seen them in years. And I go, how? And I knew they had caused the church they left a lot of trouble. <laughs> and of course, me being an honorary, I knew they weren't going to that church anymore, but I thought, I just can't resist. <laughs> so how's it going at your church, and how's Pastor so-and-so? <laughs> there were six of them together, three couple. Well, we don't go there anymore. But Lindell, oh, Lindell, <laughs> we have found what we've been looking for. I said, oh, my Lord, what have you found? Oh, we have found communion. There's just, we have church at our house now. These are some people who used to be in Brownsville. We have church in our house now. Oh, it's everything. Oh, Lindell, it's everything we ever wanted it to be. And I said, who all is there? Well, this Six of us. I said, anybody else? Our best friends. There's about 12 of us all together. I said, oh, that's awesome, but it's not church. No. What are you saying? The church, the Old Testament, New Testament met house to house. No, they met in the synagogue and house to house. Uh, <laughs> I said, got a question for you. Does anybody there get on your nerves? Like make you mad. No, it's just perfect. I said, it's not a church. <laughs> Sister Hootin' Doodle's got to be there somewhere. You know the one who drives you insane. When she's on that side of the church after the service, you go out that door. Because you know what you're going to have to deal with if you get that her. And she just grates on you and makes you mad. Stuff comes out of your mouth that you just got up from the altar worshiping God. And Sister Hootin' Doodle can pull it out of you. She's so obnoxious. Does she not know what an idiot she is? You got to have her. Because you would really think you had it together unless somebody was bumping up against you on your sharp edges. And they can't do it while you're sitting on the couch watching TV at home. You got to be here with all these messy sheep. You can get some sheep poop on you. Get down here with the rest of us and stink. Have you ever noticed some people about to leave a church, they get holier than the whole church? <laughs> We're just going to have to move on because this is just not for us. <laughs> it was 20 years. But all of a sudden, something changed. Wonder what it was. Did the pastor change? No, probably you. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I shouldn't have gone there. But you see, discipleship makes you get around other disciples. 
and wash one another's feet and bump up against all your rough edges and repent when you get mad and you want to just slap Sister Hoot and Doodle. <laughs> and then there's Brother Suck the Life out of you. You know him. <laughs> Just, you feel like when you walk into his presence, a straw goes in and all, all of your energy. By the time he's finished, you feel like giving up. It's called the body of Christ. Armpits, but fitly joined together and other stuff we won't talk about. Discipleship. So if we're going to come in by grace and we're going to come into discipleship and become real students of the word. Now we know the word, which makes us not an open target for the coming deception. Don't you think that AI is not going to bring deception? Don't you think? Matter of fact, did you all know the Bible says we're going to judge angels? Did you know that? Do you also know, I wish I had it pulled up right now. In Ephesians, there's a passage where it says these men and women will stand in the pulpit as deceivers, they're not even human. That's what the Bible says. They're demons. They're shape-shifting demons preaching, and you don't know the word and know the difference. I challenge my church, if you hear anything I preach, you don't believe it if it ain't in the word. Okay. So after we are disciples, now we're not set up for deception. What's the next move to get to power? Holiness. The purifier. The old saints used to call it sanctification. Being set apart. Boy, I could preach on that a while. I told my church some years ago, I said, I got a question. Is there anything Christians don't do anymore? When I was a kid... Christians didn't do certain things or wear certain things or go to certain places, but now I can't really figure out anything that makes us any different from the world at all. Y'all cussing like the world? Oh, you're not dropping the F-bomb or the GD, but you definitely got the S, H, and D one down when you get good and mad, and you're dropping that stuff and acting like you're holy on Sunday. Are you kidding me? You ain't sanctified. You ain't set apart. You two up in all your YouTube and TikTok stuff that you're listening to all that stuff and you're copying that instead of copying holiness. You hear me? Holiness. Now here's how important holiness is. Hebrews 12.10 says, now here's where I, I don't know your name, Sister Evangelist, but listen, this blew me away because the Lord showed me four steps. Grace, discipline, holiness, and power. He just gave them to me. I wrote them down. And then I pulled this scripture up. Listen to this. Hebrews 12, 10. For they, our parents, disciplined us for a short time as what seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. If you won't be disciplined and you won't become a disciple, you'll never be holy. 2 yeah. Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us ask the Lord to cleanse us. And that's not what it says. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I'm wrapping it up, but I want you to walk through this with me. I want you to see it. I came in as a wretched sinner. My cousins are here tonight, and they can testify this to be true. Our grandfather was a gambler, a drunkard, a bootlegger, a fiddle player. He had 10 children, had no idea who God was. Grandma had a little bit of religious training in the General Baptist. Her mother was a General Baptist, but knew very little of anything God. My grandparents on the Tipton side were what you would call heathens. 
My grandfather was a hard-working man, but when he would get drunk, he would disappear for a period of time, and he would go out and gamble and go on drunks. He'd come back home, work as a sharecropper. Yeah, white people were sharecroppers too. <laughs> Ten kids living in a little house where you could see the chickens running under the, door, under the floor because of the cracks in the board. They had nothing. Barefoot all summer, got one pair of shoes for Christmas. Poor. Matter of fact, po. Can't even afford both O's. <laughs> and back then, there wasn't no government cheese either. <laughs> they were poor. My mother, at 11 years old, went to the Assembly of God Church in Culin, Missouri. They were in mighty revival. Only about 400 people in the whole town, 200 were in the church. My mother, as a little girl, 11 years old, gave her heart to Jesus in a revival service. She convinced her younger brother, Thomas, your dad, to come to the services. Gwen went. Jerry went. They all got saved and eventually got Grandpa Thomas there. And my mother told me something that blew me away. We all like the story where you come to the altar, you get saved, you change, hallelujah. But I found out from my mother before she died that my grandfather came to the altar in those revival services six times. The sixth time he changed. Five times he didn't. That messes up our theology in the church. But I want to tell you what it should tell you tonight. If there's sin in your life and you need to get right with God, if you come down here, whisper the prayer, say it, and you didn't change, you didn't get saved, that prayer did not save you. Okay? You are saved by a transformation. If you didn't get the transformation, pray it again. And pray it again. And pray it again. Until you know you've been changed till you know you've been born again and no devil in hell can convince you otherwise because God has went down into the bedrock of your spirit and said he's mine she's mine transform change hey is this all right we all guy in my church named Kenny Ames, first year I had a church in the YMCA come up. He was a bass player. You know him, Thomas. Bass player in club bands. Walks up, never been a Christian in his life. I preach. He comes forward to get saved, snot's dripping off of his face. He's cussing like a sailor. His prayer is full of the F-bombs. It was so awesome. I think he dropped a couple of GDs right there in the altar. <laughs> but God had rested his heart. And he came down and he said, I don't know how to pray. I said, well, here's what we're going to do, son. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Wash me in the blood. He repeated after me. Except I think he said effing sinner. <laughs> Which, who would doubt that? I mean, come on. crying like a baby, bawling. After church, I said, son, can we meet this week? I have a gift for you. And he said, yeah, I can meet you tomorrow. I said, okay, great. I met him. He's still swearing like a sailor. I mean swearing like a sailor. I gave him a Bible. I said, I want you to open up the Gospel of John. I showed him where it was. He'd never seen a Bible. I said, here, Gospel of John. Read right there. Start there. And I said, in a few days, when you're in the middle of it, call me. He called me up. He said, we need to meet. A week later, I said, okay, still cussing, still swearing. He said, well, Pastor Lindell, I, I started in Genesis. I said, so you disobeyed me? He said, well, I thought, why start a book in the middle? <laughs> I said, well, when you get to Leviticus, you'll understand why I told you. <laughs>
so he said, you know, I did get to Leviticus, and I've figured out why you need a New Testament. And he's still swearing. I'll use the initials. He said, now, Pastor, I know you say it's the Word of God, and it's supposed to all be true. He said, but really? I mean, that part about the man getting swallowed by a fish, that's pretty much BS. I said, Kenny, just keep reading, just keep reading. <laughs> Wasn't too many weeks later, he discovered Joyce Meyer. Loves Joyce Meyer. She'll get you right. And buddy, she kind of worked him over good. And he calls me up one day. He said, Pastor, I need to talk to you right now. It's 2 in the morning. I said, good Lord. He said, I'm out here in Oklahoma or Dallas or something. I've just played a gig. And he said, just out of the custom I'm used to, I gave these two beautiful girls my hotel room key. He said, I've done it a thousand times. He said, I never thought anything about it. He said, you know, groupies on the road, that's a benefit. He said, but I've got back to the hotel and I walked in the lobby and something got a hold of me and I'm scared to go to my room. And he said, I don't think I should. What is that? <laughs> I said, it's called Jesus, son. You have Jesus. He started seeing a girl at the church and they were having a Bible study at her house one night in January, it started sleeting. He had an old pickup. You know, pickups don't have good traction on ice. He was the last one to leave the Bible study. Next morning, he called me. He said, Pastor, it happened again. I said, what? He said, well, I, I, I've stopped all the sex on the road thing. I've stopped all that. I've just, I said, why did you stop it? He said, because Jesus told me not to do this anymore. He said, I didn't feel good about doing it anymore. I said, son, always remember, Christians can sin, but they just don't enjoy it like they used to. I said, because you're a new creature. He said, well, something happened last night. I said, what? He said, well, I was the last one to leave the Bible study. By the time I head, headed down out of her apartment, drove to the road, he said, my truck slid off in the ditch. I couldn't get it out. I couldn't get a tow truck. The roads were ice. You know, we're like, uh, I don't know if it's that way here, but in Nashville, when it like a quarter inch of snow and we shut everything down for a week and buy all the milk and bread. <laughs> and so I'm trying to hurry. Y'all are so sweet to stay this long. So he said, I, I, I went back and I had to spend the night at her house. He said, I had no choice. He said, but this morning, when, he said, now, Pastor, she slept in her bedroom with the door locked. I slept on the couch in all my clothes. <laughs> he said, I didn't even kiss her good night. He said, but this morning I felt so bad leaving her house. Why did I feel bad? Because I didn't do anything. I said, oh, son, that's the Holy Ghost. He said, why is the Holy Ghost making me feel bad? I said, Bec oh, I feel this. Because the Holy Ghost makes you concerned about other people's reputation. <laughs> and she's a Christian girl and a man's leaving her apartment in the morning. That don't look right. Anyway. The Lord will get you holy if you'll just let him sanctify you. And finally, walk with me. I came in by grace. My grandfather was an alcoholic and a drunkard. I'm not highly educated. I don't have anything to give to the king. But I came up and knocked on the door of the house. Jesus is the door. And he graciously said, come on in. And he put a robe on me and a ring on my finger. And he said, I've been waiting on you. Because I was Pentecostal, I went straight to the buffet of the gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> but if you don't understand grace and you go straight to the gifts of the Spirit, it's kind of like Chinese food. 
it won't hold you. Grace will hold you. We just ran through grace as Pentecostals. We wanted to get through the tongue. We want to speak in tongues. And I'm a tongue talker. Don't, don't doubt it for a minute. But if you don't understand the act of propitiation, you don't under, propitiation, if you don't understand the goodness of Jesus, the love of the Father, if you don't understand that, you're not going to be able to hold on through the stuff that comes through your life. You're going to realize that God loves you and he has a plan for you and he bought you with a price and you don't have to be like your father. You don't have to be like your mother. You don't have to be like where you came from. It's because grace just gave you a new name and restored you from all your filthiness and unrighteousness and made you a son and a daughter. Oh my Lord, grace did all that. Grace and mercy. Oh, came into my life. I didn't get what I deserved. I got what he gave me. When I understand that now, I go into discipleship and I go, Papa, I want to be your son. Show me how. Pastor, show me what I should do. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me when I'm acting up. Tell me when I need to straighten up. Disciple me. Give me some scripture when the devil starts fighting me and I don't think I'm saved. Give me some scriptures like this. There is therefore no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I am not under condemnation. I am a child of God. That's what discipleship does. And let discipleship lead you into holiness. And say, now, Lord, you know, the Bible calls people who will not be corrected bastards. He said, the Heavenly Father disciplines those he loves. And if you're not disciplined, you're not a son. You look over at your neighbor and say, it's normal. So now I'm coming into discipleship out of grace and I'm embracing the word. I'm embracing being under someone, being corrected, learning, leaning in, washing the feet of those who are leading me. I want to learn. I want to know. I want to be like Jesus. You're leaning into that. And then you begin to, by osmosis, move into holiness. And you start being sanctified. And you start laying aside filthiness of the flesh. It's not holiness that you gain. It's holiness you walk in because of grace and discipline. And you suddenly start going, I want to be holy because God said be holy. It's not a trip to the altar. It's a lifestyle now. I'm living holy. I'm living holy. I'm living holy. Not to brag about it. I just don't want to anymore. My son is going through a time right now where there's movies you don't want to watch and music you don't want to hear. There's a holiness that's coming into his life. Now, once I've been through those three steps, now I'm ready to walk in power. Why? Because power is that of a magistrate, a principality, a principal ruler. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you authority to trample serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Acts 1 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Luke 8 46, and Jesus said, Somebody touch me, for I perceive power going up out of me. Romans 1 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to anyone who believes. For 2 Timothy 1 1, therefore, we also pray for always that you would count be counted worthy of this calling and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Now that's my sermon. What am I saying? I'm saying that if we go from grace to power, we're going to get in heresy. Because the Bible says many deceivers are on their way. They're coming. 
One line of truth, one line of deception. One line of truth, one line of deception. Well, he preached a good word. Yeah, part of it is good, but the second line, listen to it, it's not good. That word is good, that word's not good. How can good and bad water flow out of the same fountain? How can sweet and bitter water, no, no, there's something wrong here. I ain't listening to this guy. Sorry, good guy, but no, 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 no. Uh -uh, no, 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 I ain't listening to that because I don't want to be deceived. So what am I saying? I'm simply saying this. If you're new in the kingdom, if you're old in the kingdom, but you didn't get grace right, go back to the front door and go, Lord, let me just thank you. Let me fully embrace and let me fully breathe in the fragrance of the goodness of God and the grace of God. And Lord, I've been pulling my shoulder back from correction. I've been pulling away from people trying to correct me. I've been pulling away from any church where the pastor preaches any word that might correct me. I've been pulling away from anybody trying to instruct me. I'm not a disciple. I want to be a disciple, Lord. So I humble myself, and I become a student of your word. I want to know it. Right? And Lord, you disciple me and discipline me so that I can be a partaker of your holiness. Let me tell you something about holy. I didn't, I didn't use this passage very importantly. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. You don't bypass it. And I understand there's a lot of preaching on holiness. A lot of it. And everybody says it's different things. Remember, we don't do works for salvation. But after salvation, we work. You work on getting your mind renewed and transformed. You work on your spirit conquering your flesh. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against power, principalities. We do that, but we also have an inward battle. Let me close with this. Can I do this? Is this all right? I've been trying to close a long time. It's really late. It's really late. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm tired. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to close with this. We're in a time right now that so many precious ones are being pulled by the enemy. They're being pulled. They're being pulled right out of the house. The enemy's having his way. But let me tell you something. God's going to have a church that won't bow to anything the devil's got. They're going to stand in the full authority of the word of God. They're going to stand in the whole armor of God that they may be able to resist the powery darts of the enemy. They're going to stand against him. We are not going to fail, friends. He is not coming for a ragtag, beat up bunch of people. He's coming for a glorious church without spot or blemish. He's coming for us. So as I close this message, I want to ask you this. As I've been preaching, has the Holy Spirit spoke to you about some stuff that is unsurrendered? Unsurrendered. You won't surrender it. You've even, maybe you've tried to surrender it, but you need help. You need help getting it out of your life. Now remember, this is not about living perfect, but this is about living as a disciple. When you hold up the mirror and you see stuff that doesn't look like Jesus, remove it. Somebody says, how do I do that? You have the power to do that. You can do that. But God uses preaching like tonight to magnify those things. So to that, tonight as we close this meeting, we're going to pray for people. As we close this meeting, if there's something in your life. Now, I want to clarify this, okay? Please. Let's just don't be churchy. I, I'm not very religious. I don't do it very well. Let's don't be churchy. Just because somebody comes or invites, we'll come. Look, all of us are imperfect. I bet you I can find you 10 things about myself today I don't like. We're not talking about those. We're talking about, as we've preached the word tonight, what has the Holy Spirit brought up? 
Now, let me tell you the difference between the devil bringing it up and the Holy Spirit. Would you like to know? It's real, I'm a very simple preacher, right? I make things real plain. Have you noticed? Real plain. You guys are following Jesus, right? Do you know the difference between conviction and condemnation? Do you fully understand it? They're almost alike. Matter of fact, they're so much alike that there's only one factor that will delineate one from the other. Condemnation is when you hear a message like this and you go, oh, I'm just so messed up, I give up. I'm so messed up, there's so much not right. I, I just, what's the point? That's condemnation. That's coming from the enemy. If you don't think the enemy is here tonight whispering in your ear, trust me, he is. Because he doesn't want you to hear the Holy Spirit. He wants you to get overwhelmed with condemnation. Condemnation will make you get in your car feeling just as lousy as you did when you got here and feeling just as frustrated and nothing will change. He won. If you let condemnation win, condemnation is like a big ball of confusion. You can't really identify exactly what's wrong. There's just a lot wrong. Right? When everybody says, oh, I got, everything's wrong. It's called condemnation. But the Holy Spirit is different. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, I want you to see what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's coming into your life and he's going, now look, here's about two things. Never more than three in my life at a time. One or two things that we need to correct. And during this message, if it's the Holy Spirit, he will have made it very clear that you need to get these things taken care of. If, oh, this is the beauty of God. If the Holy Spirit has pointed them out, then that means the power of God is here to set you free from it. Right? If it's all confusion, then God's not speaking to you about anything. Don't worry about it. Somebody says, how do I know how I hear God? Is the word encouraging? Is the word directing you to go closer to God? Is it telling you, I'll give you this if you'll give me that? Is he trading you something for something better? If it is, if the clarity of the Lord's word to you is to bring you in closer to God, then that's the Lord doing that. If the plan is to get you to leave and be frustrated and keep living with the issue you've been living with, then that is not the Holy Spirit. That is a demon spirit, and it's trying to confuse you and get you from responding to this word. Now, do we all understand that? With that in mind, how many would say that the Holy Spirit tonight in this message, in this evening, has spoken to you about a thing or two? that you need to just get corrected in your life and you need to get discipled and you need to get it straightened out because something's kind of run amok in there. It may be something very small or it can be something very large. It doesn't matter. How many would agree or say without plagiarism, yes, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. Raise your hand. Awesome. Thank you. See, now that's clarity. That's good then he's going to deliver you of that. He's going to give you overcoming power right now over that situation. This church obviously loves revival. They love the move of God. I feel at home. I usually don't preach this long everywhere I go. It's really late. Sorry. <laughs> but hey, it took me. I almost died getting here. As a matter of fact, we booked this thing twice. And I had to have another surgery. So, I mean, I, I'm making up for lost. I'm just kind of doing a three-in-one kind of thing here. We're just getting all three of them in one night. So y'all just hang on, all right? But the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, Holy Spirit. First of all, Father, thank you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you because he leads us and guides us in the ways of all truth. Thank you because he directs us. And thank you because you're directing us toward holiness. And thank you, God, that people in this room are not going to just talk about power. They're going to walk in it. They're going to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. 
They're going to do all the power works that we are called to do. And when they do, having come through grace, discipline, and holiness, when the devil accuses them in mid-sentence when they're casting a demon out, they will not doubt that they are walking in truth because they've dealt with everything else and that spirit of lies is why. So God, thank you that your sweet spirit is in this room tonight. Thank you that we felt him from the very beginning. And Lord, today we just surrender everything, every bit of it to you. And we say, Lord, transfer us into a deeper place of your glory. And Lord, let the overcoming power that's working in us begin to rise up against these issues that we're struggling with. God, you understand the struggle. So God, lift us up above the fray and help us overcome right now by the power of your name. In Jesus' name. And we silence every voice that might be speaking to us other than the voice of our Lord. Speak, Holy Spirit. Speak, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I don't know what your custom is here. It's uh, 956. But uh, there are people here who need prayer. We're going to pray for you. Um, I will pray. I won't I'll pray as much as I can. God wants to empower you. Here's what I hear the Lord saying tonight. The thing that you have struggled with, tonight is the final night. When it tries to come back again, you will speak firmly the word of the Lord against it. It has caused you to fail. It's caused you to fear it's caused you to be sidetracked but in the name of jesus right now it has no more power in your life it has no more authority in your life because the holy spirit has spotlighted it today and as i draw you as i call of you forward i want everyone who wants prayer to come i want those who raised your hand to come and what we're going to do before i turn this to pastor Dwayne, what we're going to do is we're going to begin to sing a chorus of some sort. Y'all will do that, I hope. And basically what I want to do is I want us to pray together. And then we're going to pray for you. Is that all right? Is that all right? Let's all stand together. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, you can do so by clicking here. Also, there is another message that I know will bless you just by clicking over here. Thank you, and we pray that we will see you again here at Tag Church. God bless you.